good morning everyone uh, welcome to uh, this webinar this morning on introduction to linear dynamics my name is Chris Dudding I work for EDR Modesto so if we go on to uh, today's webinar uh, linear dynamics I'm going to be covering the following subjects and it's mainly a demo based webinar so I'll be doing live demos in each of these areas so we'll be covering modal analysis of free vibration harmonic and response analysis, spectrum analysis, random vibration. We'll have a brief discussion about damping uh, and, and then we'll finish. So let's start off then with modal analysis. So this is the most fundamental type of uh, linear dynamic analysis. And I, I tend not to put too many equations, uh, too much maths in, in my presentations, but we in ANSYS what we're doing is solving the stiffness matrix and the mass matrix in, in order to uh, uh, find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So the eigenvalues are the natural frequencies. So we, we're trying to find the frequency at which a structure will resonate. And when it's resonating, what mode shape it takes up. What's the main purpose for this? Well, we see it in a lot of industries. The main purpose of this is to design out any unwanted natural frequencies. Uh, so you can make a structure stiff enough so it won't vibrate in, in the operating conditions, won't be excited. We also, modal analysis is, always used, is often used as a prerequisite to calculate what we call participation factors that are used in other types of linear dynamics calculations. And you'll see that as we go through today's demonstrations. The participation factor is really the amount of mass of the structure which is contributing to the vibration in a particular direction. So let's start off with a demo of modal analysis. So I'm going to start off all these demos with a geometry branch. So if I just select geometry, my right mouse click, and I'll import some geometry. I'm going to import this fan geometry. And then we drag the modal analysis branch across. And we get our system. So yeah, we get our system, and then I can open up ANSYS Mechanical. We can see down here that the mechanical interface is starting. It takes a few seconds uh, while Workbench goes away and checks the license status and so on and launches the application. Whenever I do these webinars, I hate this pause while it starts for the first time. Okay, here we are, the mechanical application is opened. It's just importing the geometry or attaching the geometry. And here we've got the geometry. So this is uh, a fan blade model. And we're going to do a model analysis on this fan blade model. First thing we need to do is put a mesh on there. So I'm just going to put in a 2.5 millimeter sized mesh. Let's just have a look at that mesh. Uh, so we can see the mesh there. Uh, generally, the, the mesh requirements uh, for modal analysis are pretty similar. We, we're trying to capture the stiffness. So it's pretty similar to do a, doing a static structural analysis when you're interested in deflections. Uh, I'm going to fix this fan, uh, fan blade at the, uh, at the center. So I'm just going to put in a fixed support, select the surface, fix it at the center. And then essentially, in terms of setting up that model, uh, that's all you need to do for modal analysis. If we go down to analysis settings here, uh, there are some settings, controls, so it, how many modes do I want to find? I'm just going to leave this as six. Six is the default. So extract the first six natural frequencies. If I wanted, I could go down here and say, do I want it, the, the frequencies to be a certain range? I could restrict uh, the results to a particular range. I'm just going to leave it as the first six in this case. And essentially, we can go away and solve them. So I'll solve this model. As I say, it's a linear analysis, so generally it's fairly quick. Although modal analyses are usually quite uh, heavy on the memory. So if you have a big model, uh, you may require a lot of memory on your machine. Solves pretty quickly. And here we can see, I select the solution branch down here, I can see this first six natural frequencies. So we can see 
Uh, this, this, the first natural frequency of the structure is 762 hertz. The sixth natural frequency is around 1106 hertz. And if we want the mode shape, so the mode shape for the first natural frequency, I just select it from the chart down here and create mode shape. And I solve this and select the mode shape. And here we can see the deformation. So when this fan blades, uh, uh, this impeller, if you like, is vibrating, uh, in its first natural frequency, this is the mode shape it will take up. Now, up here we have a result which says displacement millimeters and it says 48 millimeters. Now, this isn't a true value, it's just showing the shape that the, the structure will take when it's resonating. The actually amplitude of the, res uh, of, of the vibration is dependent on actually the, the loading that's applied, and in this case, we've got no loading. So this value is normalized, it's not a true value, it's normalized to the mass matrix. Let's just uh, extract mode shape six. And let's have a look at this mode shape, and we mode shape six. So here we can see uh, if we had an excitation that would, would excite mode shape six, this is the shape it would take up. And again, the value here in terms of response, this is a normalized value, it's not a true value. So that's a basic model analysis, that's the basic process, it's quite a simple analysis, and we see a lot of customers out there doing model analysis. The main reason is really to determine whether they can stiffen the structure to move those natural frequencies out of the operating range that the, the structure might see when it's out in the field. Now quite often, let me just shrink this down, Quite often, uh, if uh, a lot of these structures are subjected to some pre-stress, and a pre-stress will change its natural frequency. So imagine a guitar string. When you tighten the guitar string, the natural frequency goes up, the pitch goes up. And the same thing occurs with structures. So quite often with structures, you, you want to, um, with modal analysis, you want to proceed simulation with a stress analysis. So I'm just going to do an example of a pre-stressed uh, model analysis on this particular structure. So if we take static structural and just drag it across to the geometry branch here, so I'm just sharing the geometry. It's a new analysis, but sharing the fan geometry. And then we select model analysis and we drop this across to the results branch. Uh, I'll just rename this pre-stress model analysis. So let's just open this model. So again, down here, the feedback is engraved, but down here it says static mechanical. We're just waiting for this session to open. It should pop up soon. There she, there she blows. Okay, so now we're doing a pre-stress analysis. We can see we've got a, a structural static branch and we've got a modal branch. So we set up the structural static analysis first. Again, I'll use a 2.5 millimeter mesh on this. Let's generate the mesh. And then let's put in a support. Again, we will support this uh, central hub uh, with a fixed support. Insert. Which support. Uh, and then as a structural loading, I'm going to put some rotational velocity. So if we insert a rotational velocity, I'm going to define this by components. So if we put 5,000 RPM around the y axis, we can see from the triad here that the y axis is the uh, actual direction. So it's spinning around the, the actual direction uh, at 5,000 RPM. And we can do uh, a structural analysis, we'll do the structural analysis first. I'll put in uh, the deformation and we'll just put in some equivalent stress here. So we were doing a normal structural analysis. We'll just solve this branch to start with. I'll just click on the dialog box so we can see what's going on.
So the structural analysis is finished. Here we've got a displacement to, due to the centrifugal loading. Here we've got equivalent stress due to the centrifugal loading, round, loading around about 70 megapascals. And now we can see if it's under the modal branch, because we attached it to the structural analysis, we can say the pre-stress analysis is taken from the results of the structural analysis. And then we can just go ahead and solve the modal analysis. Now, because this structure is stressed, it should be a little bit stiffer. So we should see that the natural frequencies now are higher than we saw in the unstressed model analysis. So if we select the results, here we can see the first natural six natural frequencies. Uh, if you recall, I'll just bring up the previous model. If you recall, the first natural frequency on the previous model was around 762. So we've seen it go up by about eight hertz, the natural frequency from introducing a, a, a preloaded, if you like. Let's just bring up the previous model just to show that. We can see a 762, the sixth natural frequency was 1106. And in the pre-stress model, the sixth natural frequency is now higher. It's, a, it's a 1113, so it's gone up. So that's the process for doing a pre-stressed model analysis. Now, I'm just going to go back to our project page, close those two analyses. And I'm just going to do another model analysis. We'll start off with the geometry again. So I'll select the geometry branch. I'll do import geometry. I'm going to import this frame model. And we'll do another modal analysis on this. By the end of today, you'll have seen quite a few modal analyses. So we'll do a modal analysis on this frame. Let's start the uh, Francis Mechanical. And what I want to show on here is how we view the participation factors. So the participation factors is what we use to uh, calculate the, it's basically the mass of the structure which is participating in vibration in a particular direction. And this is used in, in order to, to calculate things like harmonic response spectrum analysis, random vibration, and so on. So in this particular model, we've got a frame here. And you know this, this sort of thing is typical of the type of analyses we see for modal analysis. Uh, you can imagine here, I've got four pads. If you imagine some structure attached to this that is applying some sort of vibration to this structure, you may want to design this structure in such a way that it's, it doesn't resonate when, when this thing uh, is subjected to an excitation loading. So you might want to calculate the natural frequency on this. Uh, we need to go in and fix it. First thing we need to do, as I did before, is we need to fix it somewhere. So I'm going to select these eight. There's eight holes in this model. Select them all by the same size. You can see there's four on this end and four on the other end here. And I'm going to insert a fixed support here. So we've fixed this model. Let's put a mesh on here. I'm just going to put initial mesh on here of 20 millimeters. It's only a demo. We don't need to be ultra accurate. But we do need to be quick. So I'll put a reasonably coarse mesh on there, but not too bad. So we've got a mesh on there. Like before, if we go down to analysis settings, let's just extract the first six modes, whatever they might be. I'm just going to put in here output control stress. So I'm just, just going to select yes here. Uh, and then we'll solve the model. Let's just uh, click on here and it opens the dialog box that you used to have pre 2020 version of ANSYS. So in this analysis, again, we've extracted the first six modes. We can see the first mode is around about 31 hertz. The sixth mode, around about 108 hertz. And if we look at the mode shape, let's extract the first mode shape. And just uh, solve that mode shape and look at it. And look at the vibration. We can see here that the first mode shape, if the structure was uh, excited in this particular at this particular frequency, we would see that it would have uh, uh, 
a, a motion which is predominantly in the y direction if we select the sixth mode uh, the sixth natural frequency and create the mode shape and we uh, select that mode shape and animate it so if this was resonating this structure was resonating in the sixth natural frequency at around 108 hertz you can see this is the, the 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 mode shape this is the motion it would take up and we can see that that's predominantly in the z direction now if we go down and select the solution information branch and we now go down and select participation factor summary we can actually see the participation factors and i could uh, slide down here the participation factors here for each mode uh, as a ratio of the total mass and we can see uh, uh, in the y direction the first natural frequencies its influence or the participation factors predominantly predominantly in the y direction which is what we saw in the mode shape so when it's resonating at the first natural frequency, 52% of the mass is contributing to the motion in, in, in the Y direction. Similarly, I can never say that word, uh, if we select mode shape six, where we saw most of the motion in the Z direction, we can see mode shape six, 18, 19% of the mass of the structure is contributing uh, to the res resonance in that particular direction of that frequency. So this information is used downstream to calculate the effect in a particular direction when we have uh, an excitation in the analysis. I just want to select, uh, insert in here, if you remember I selected that we wanted to output stress. When you're doing a modal analysis, you can create a stress plot. You may have seen this if you've done this in the past. So here we've got a stress plot on this structure and we can see the stress distribution that mode shape would in this case when it's resonating. The value here, 447, it says megapascals and it says 447. This is not a correct value. This is not an accurate value. This value is normalized to the mass matrix. So it's a relative value. Just wanted to stress that. So let's just shrink this model. Let's just go back to the presentation and move on to harmonic response, anal response analysis. So we did a couple of model analyses there. We created the mode shapes and we created the, and we, we calculated the natural frequencies created the mode shapes. Now I stress there that the actual displacement you see and the stress you see is normalized to the mass matrix. It's not a true value. So how do we extract the true value? We have to put some excitation load into the model. So the next type of linear analysis that we see, uh, linear dynamics analysis that we see is harmonic response analysis. And in harmonic response analysis, we're applying some sinusoidal load to the structure. So we, we're vibrating the structure at some frequency. Uh, when we do that, we can determine a true response. So we determine the true deformation, we can turn, determine the true calculated stress when this thing resonates at a particular frequency. So a sinusoidal loading like this has two, it's a complex loading. Uh, so it has two parts, it has a real part which represents the amplitude of the loading, and it has an imaginary part which represents the phase. Uh, you can have multiple, in an harmonic response anal analysis, you can have multiple harmonic loads operating in different directions, uh, but they're always of the same frequency, but they can be out of phase. So the phase only becomes important if you've got multiple loads. Uh, damping is critical, as we'll see in the demonstration. So what's the purpose of an harmonic response analysis? And we see quite a lot of our customers doing harmonic analysis because there's a lot of machinery out there that applies harmonic loads. Anything that rotates, so motors, gearboxes, shafts, turbines, any rotating or reciprocating machinery often puts a dynamic sinusoidal or harmonic loading on the structure that it's attached to. And in a harmonic analysis, quite often you want to play around with damping to try and uh, eliminate those resonant frequencies in the structure. So let's go on to the demonstration of harmonic response. Now I'm going to use the same model. So that frame we just looked at and we did a modal analysis. Let's sort of, for the harmonic response analysis, we're going to assume that there's, a, there's something like a motor or a gearbox attached to that model. So if I select harmonic response, 
and then drag this across to the solution branch. I'm using the output of the modal analysis, those participation factors, if you like, as input into the harmonic response analysis. Now, this type of analysis, where you're doing the modal analysis first, and you are uh, using the solution as input into a harmonic analysis, is what we call a mode superposition analysis. So the actual mode shapes that we've calculated in, in, in the first stage of that analysis, the modal analysis, for the frequencies that fall between the natural frequencies, we do an interpolation of the actual mode shape to calculate uh, the particular mode, uh, mode shape at any particular eigen vector at any particular frequency. You can do a fully coupled analysis without doing a modal analysis first, but it's much more computationally expensive. So I'm doing a, what's called a mode superposition analysis. Let's just open up this box. And we can see now uh, it's our the same model, but now we've got this harmonic response uh, uh, branch and we need to put something in there. Also, when I've attached the harmonic response, it's reset the modal analysis, so we'll have to rerun that. So let's just set that going first and rerun that modal analysis. So we're nearly there and we can see we've got our mode shapes as we had before and now we can go down and harmonic response we can apply a harmonic load into this so let's pretend there's some equipment rotating equipment attached to these four pads we can see here so i'll do an insert and i'll insert a force a harmonic force on these uh, four surfaces we'll apply those I'm going to apply it by component directions. So if you recall from the uh, modal analysis, the first natural frequency, the participation factor was mainly in the Y direction. The maximum response we expect to see is in the Y direction. And it's quite possible the maximum uh, loading excitation is in the Y direction. So we're interested in this case, we're just looking at the Y direction. So I'm going to put a, a Oh, the other thing to note is if we look down in, in this details window, you have a phase angle. As I said, the loads in a harmonic response analysis are complex. We have a real part, which is the actual value or the amplitude, which I'm going to put in 250 newtons. And then we have a phase angle. So if you have multiple loads that are out of phase, you can put a phase angle in here. I'm just going to leave this as zero. So that's my datum point. I've only got a single load, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, then when we run the analysis we we specify that we normally what you're wanting here is the response of the structure to a, a frequency range so i'm going to put a frequency range of not 50 hertz this may be the operating range of the, the reciprocating machinery that's attached to here and i'm going to solve it at every i'm going to put 50 solve interval intervals in there which means it will solve at every one hertz and what we're usually interested in terms of results is a frequency response. If we go down here, we've got frequency response. I'm going to select a deformation response. And I'm going to apply it to all the geometry here. So let's just go down and solve that. Actually, I'm just going to stop that solve because I've missed something off the demo. The other thing you might want to do here and I probably want to do is just go down to output controls. Oh, it's, it's okay. It's already I've selected stress before. Because in a harmonic response, we can get true stress values. You need to make sure that the output controls is solving for stress. So let's just set that solve going again. So it's nearly there, expanding the harmonic solution. So here we can see we've solved all 50 frequencies from 0 to uh, 50 hertz. 
And if we go down and look at the frequency response, uh, I've made a second mistake. I didn't think I'd get through today without making a mistake. I can see by my plot that actually the response in the X direction is what I've calculated. I actually wanted the Y direction because we think that's going to be worst case. So I'm just going to go back and uh, just clear those results. Clear generated data. Do I need to uh, change this? to y-axis, I want the response in the y-axis. Let's just solve this for a third time. You never get through these sort of demos without making one mistake. So just to reiterate there, you know, we applied the loading in the y-direction, the vertical direction. We think the maximum response is gonna be in the vertical direction uh, because of the mode shape. So I want to calculate the response in the vertical direction. Nearly there. And we'll go to the response diagram. That looks much better. So here we've got a graph from 1 to 50 hertz, and we've got the amplitude response in the Y direction. And we can see we you know, uh, a large amplitude around about the first natural frequency and a smaller one around about the second natural frequency. So we can see this structure will resonate at those natural frequencies. Now, what we can see here is, you know, it's quite an even plot, and this is a large spike, and we may not be picking up this peak here. We really want to pick up the peak. So what I'm going to do is go in and cluster the results around the peaks here. So if I go back to analysis settings, and I change every vert, I'll say cluster results to yes, and I'll put uh, 20 in here, and let's resolve this with clustered results and see how that plot changes. Nearly there. And our results. So now you can see with this frequency response plot, now we've got much more data, more, 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 many more data points around where the structure is resonating. And we better, up, we, we, we more accurately picking up that spike. Unfortunately, the result it's given us is uh, 4,000 millimeters, four meters. The, you know, the structure is only two meters or so in length. This is huge. And the reason for that is, is because we put no damping into the structure. So uh, when you have an undamped structure and you excite a particular frequency, then it's, it's basically its amplitude is unbounded. It approaches infinity, if you like. And this is what we're picking up here. So this is not a true reflection. In order to get a true result, we have to put some damping into the, into the structure. So I'm going to do that. If I go back, to the analysis settings and you can see down here we've got a, a damping control section and we've got different types of damping i'll discuss in in, in, in a little bit more detail uh damping at, at the end of the demonstrations but i'm just going to put in here a global damping ratio of four percent and then i'm going to resolve this for a third time or in our case the fourth time because i made a mistake the first time so i'm just going to solve it again and put some damping in there and hopefully, if I've done everything correct, we should get some more realistic results. And here we are, nearly finished the solution. And uh, let's have a look at the frequency response. And here we can see with 4% damping, we're getting much more realistic results. We're getting a, a maximum displacement when it resonates at the first natural frequency of 2.5 millimeters on average across the structure. We can see the second natural frequency is almost damped out, maybe a small blip, but there's very little effect in the second natural frequency. So we're getting much more realistic results. If we want to look at what the deformation and stress looks like, if I select this frequency response branch, 
can do right mouse click create contour results it will pick out the worst case uh, deflection so we'll just solve that and get a plot now it looks very similar to the uh, as you would expect the mode shape for the first natural frequency but then now this value 5.98 if the damping is correct is pretty close to the actual results we would expect uh, it's an accurate result and because we have de deflection in there we can calculate stress hubness so if i go to the solution branch and i insert stress equivalent stress now when i select equivalent stress again again the result is complex so it has a frequency and it has a phase so we need to select the right frequency and we can grab it from here from the deflection branch and just insert it and we need to grab the right phase so 1.535 radians so if i copy this and insert it here so this is the stress at the worst case uh, amplitude and we'll just solve that and here we've got a stress plot we can see actually around these bolt holes where the mesh is great we, we possibly need a uh, if we're interested in the stress we probably need to refine the mesh around these areas we can see the stress along here and we can see the value and this is much closer to being a true value we would expect in real life in this case 298 i would be a little bit concerned uh it would probably be suffer from fatigue damage with that sort of uh, stress level in a short period of time so that's harmonic response analysis let's just shut this down let's go back to the presentation so harmonic response analysis, we basically introduce a harmonic with load, load into our modal analysis and calculated the true response. Let's go down to the next type of linear dynamics problem, uh, which is spectrum analysis. So spectrum analysis is used when you have uh, an excitation load you can see in the upper right hand corner here, similar to this. So it's a much more complex load history. So we've got a, a an, an acceleration here and a time history acceleration. Now, this particular uh, excitation or this particular, uh, if you like, loading condition, we could solve this in a full time transient analysis in ANSYS. So we could take an, a, a static simulation through this full time uh, time transient loading uh, and, and obtain a response. But that type of analysis would be used. You would need thousands of load steps to capture this curve correctly. So spectrum analysis is used when you've got this type of response spectrum and you can take that response spectrum and extract all the different harmonics. It's made up of different harmonics. So by doing an FT, fast Fourier transform, you can take a signal like this and, and create, a, 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 if you like, a, an excitation spectrum in the frequency domain. So we're looking at here along the bottom, we've got frequency and we've got uh, acceleration in terms of harmonic acceleration. And then what we can do is we can solve all those harmonics and then combine them together in some manner to give us the maximum worst case response. So it's a time domain. We take a time domain excitation uh, loading and we convert it to the frequency domain. And one of the problems with doing that is you lose the phase data. So in this graph down here, we don't know whether all these harmonics are in phase or out of phase. Uh, we calculate the response for each of those frequencies and then we add them together. Now, because we've lost the phase data, we don't do a, a straightforward addition. That would be nonsense. You know, some of these uh, harmonics could be in out of phase and cancel each other out, for instance. So what we do is we combine them using a particular method. There are three methods usually used in ANSYS. Square root of sum squared, SRSS, a complete quadratic combination or the uh, Rosenbluth method. Now, the good news for if you're an analyst out there is you're usually doing a spectrum analysis to some sort of standard, and the standard will specify which of these methods you should use. The most common one we come across at EDI Modesso is possibly seismic loading. So any sort of structure, safety critical structure that may be subjected to seismic loading, usually there is a standard which will dictate that you have to do a spectrum analysis with a particular earthquake spectrum, for instance, and a particular mode combination method. We also see being using things like wave loading and wind loading. So let's go on and do a demo of a spectrum analysis. So I'll go back to my project. I'm going to start with some new geometry, but it, it, it will be familiar. So this one 
it's the same frame that we've used before, but I've uh, added, it says frame with vessel. I've added a, a pressure vessel onto this frame. So again, I'm going to do use a mode superposition method. So I'm going to do a modal analysis first. And then we're going to do a response spectrum analysis using the results of the modal analysis, the participation factors from the modal analysis. So let's open up the uh, ANSYS mechanical to do the modal analysis. The model's coming in now. So we can see here, actually, I, I, I used as a demonstration the same frame, but we can see instead of a motor, now we've got some sort of, like, I've got a pressure vessel here, but some sort of structure attached to this frame. Uh, now that pressure vessel, there's just a little bit of preparation I need to do here. This pressure vessel is a shell model. The frame is a solid model. Uh, for the shell model, I just need to give it a thickness. So I'm gonna select these parts here that have the question mark and I'm just going to give them a, an arbitrary thing there's 7.5 millimeters and then the other thing we need to do if I just go down to the contact so ANSYS has automatically created contacts between the solid parts but by default usually automatic contact generation on import of a model doesn't include uh, edge to face contact and for shell model we need to create edge to face contact so I'm just going to switch that on so if I select yes here, and then go back to contacts and do automatically connect, connect, uh, create connections, it should have created contact between not just the solid parts, but the uh, shell parts in this model. So now we can go on and do the spectrum analysis. As before, uh, the model analysis needs to be run first. So I'm just gonna put a mesh on here. I'm gonna use 20 millimeters again. Uh, if we go down to analysis settings in the modal analysis branch, I'm going to select the first six modes, uh, just the default setting. And we'll, we'll just insert in here a deformation and uh, stress in here. We'll just make sure output controls, the stress is selected, it is. And then we'll solve the mode. Let's put the mesh on first and then solve the modal analysis. So here we've got the mesh on the model. Uh, in this, in, in my case today, I'm just doing a demonstration, so it doesn't need to be perfect. Before I run the model analysis, I need to fix it. So I'm going to fix it at these bolt holes again, like we did in the uh, previous example. So I select by size. So I select the eight bolt holes by size, and we will insert a fix support. So I've just fixed it in those in all directions of those bolt holes. So let's just solve the model analysis first. I'll just click on here, which opens up the pre-version 2020 dialog box. Nearly there for the modal solution. So if we uh, look at the, here we've got the deformed shape for the first natural frequency and we can see the value, so it's 10.51 Hertz uh, and it's in the vertical Y direction. Uh, and I've got in here an equivalent stress plot, but as we discussed before, this value here from a modal analysis is normalized to the mass matrix. It's not the true value. And we want to calculate the true value. So if I go down to response spectrum now, uh, the branch down here, in terms of loading, we need to load this with our uh, frequency domain response spectrum. So I go in and we insert, uh, and this could be velocity displacement. In my case, it's an acceleration response spectrum. We have to say 
which boundary condition it's attached to. So the vibration, if you like, is coming through those supports, all supports. And then we've got a table. So if I open up Excel here, I've got an earthquake spectra. This may be given to me in some sort of standard, but anyway, I've got an earthquake spectra. I'm going to copy that. We can see the units of acceleration are G, and I'm going to just insert it into here. And this is our, our spectra. Uh, the units are in acceleration, and I'm working in millimeters, so I need to do some conversion. So I can use this scale factor to put uh, to turn it into G. And the direction, typically you would do this response spectrum at different orientations, but I, I'm, I'm just going to do the Y direction. So if we just go back to analysis settings, I'm doing a single point response spectra. So there's one response spectra. It's operating in the Y direction. And the mode combination is square root sum squared. And you can see the different combinations I've got there. Uh, last thing I need to do, let's just insert, insert a deformation plot. And let's insert a stress plot, equivalent stress. And then we're ready to solve. So it's finished, and I can plot the deformation, 38 millimeters uh, total, and I can plot the equivalent stress. So the equivalent stress here, uh, when combined using the uh, SRSS method, is 20 megapascals, pretty low for steel structure. Uh, so I could probably say, sign this off. I probably need some more work, but based on that value, I could possibly sign this off saying this is this structure is likely to survive uh, any sort of earthquake vibration. So that's uh, a spectrum analysis, a response spectrum analysis. The last type of linear dynamics problem I want to discuss today is random vibration analysis. So random vibration analysis, like a spectrum, uh, like the response spectrum analysis, is another type of spectral analysis. Uh, in a random vibration analysis, this the for any given amplitude, for any given frequency, the amplitude is not constant. It can change randomly. So the amplitude varies ram randomly. What is constant is the overall energy in the vibration, the overall power in the vibration, but the amplitude varies randomly. Uh, what we assume in a random vibration analysis is the average of the amplitude is constant. And we assume that the uh, the variation in the amplitude is a normal distribution. And by uh, having these uh, assumptions, we can calculate a statistical response of the structure. And this is key to random vibration. When you're doing random vibration, the results you get in terms of response are statistical in nature. Uh, the input into the uh, analysis is what we call a power spectral density plot, a PSD plot. And these PSD plots are, uh, and can readily be measured, readily be calculated using something like a vibration table. Uh, your customer, uh, or you would possibly be given this when you asked to look at the analysis. But uh, as I say, it's quite easy to generate a uh, power spectral density uh, input vibration signal, if you like. What's it used for? Uh, typically, uh, rockets and missiles. This one's quite interesting. Over the years, I've been into a number of customers or spoken to a number of customers, and they will say something like, we can't tell you much about what our product does, but what we can tell you is it's, it's, it's designed to sit stationary and do nothing for 20 years, and then it's used once and should last 20 seconds. Oh, it's a missile then. You know, it's a surface-to-air missile, an air-to-air missile. I've heard that on a number of occasions. Uh, also, vehicles traveling along a road, random vibration, trains traveling along rails. It's quite often railway standards will specify that if you're strapping, let's say, some equipment to a chassis of a train, then it has to withstand, you have to do a, a random vibration analysis, and it has to withstand a certain uh, PSD input. So let's go ahead and do a random vibration analysis. So I'm going to use completely different geometry this time. So we'll start off with geometry. 
let's drag it into our project. Uh, and then I'll, we'll do uh, a modal analysis, again, uh, a mode superposition analysis, and then we'll use the results from that modal analysis in our random vibration analysis. So random vibration, I will drag that onto the solution branch. And we've got our system set up. I need to attach the geometry first. So if we go in and import, and I'm going to use this circuit board model. And let's open, open up mechanical to, to do the simulation. Just waiting for mechanical to open. Importing the geometry, attaching the geometry. And here we can see we've got a circuit board. Now, I'm going to take some liberties in this demo. I'm not going to play around with the material properties and the mass quite clearly. In, in this sort of structure, uh, the material properties of the connections are probably quite important. The mass of the individual components are quite important. I'm just going to leave it with the default material, which is steel. So I'm taking some liberties just to make the demo quick. Uh, so I'm going to start off just by meshing this. I'm going to put a 0 0.75 millimeter mesh on here and we'll generate the mesh. Now, these sort of structures are quite typical. If you imagine a rocket component or a missile and that sort of thing, or even instrumentation or instruments that may be attached to the bottom of a train chassis, they're quite often electronic components, and you need to understand whether it's going to shake to bits, you know, or whether it's going to survive. So electronic components are quite common for random vibration analysis. So we need to fix it our model analysis so it's fixed at these points here these will be the source of the vibration so if i do select by size and select all four holes and insert a fixed support you can see there we've fixed all four holes i'm just going to stick with the default of six natural frequencies again uh, let's just have a look about pump controls stress is selected and we will insert deformation let's just insert deformation in this case in this first off analysis and let's solve the modal analysis bring up the dialog box so you can see it now this modal analysis will take a little bit longer than the original one uh, the frame models it's a little bit bigger model in terms of mesh and element count but it, it shouldn't take too long I don't like these pauses when I'm doing a, a live demonstration, but it's beginning to do the mode extraction. As I say, this, this analysis has got a higher, higher mesh count than the previous example, so it's taking a little bit longer. It's not far off finishing the solution now, the modal solution at least. Okay, and we've, uh, we've got a result. So if we go down, again, we can see the mode shape, um, natural frequencies. The first natural frequency is 1,034. Six natural frequency, 4390. Let's just extract some mode shape. So if I create the mode shape for the first natural frequency, and we can see the vibration again for the first natural frequency, we've got vibration in the Z direction. So I'm, I'm going to do a response analysis, a response spectrum analysis. Sorry, I'm going to do a, a random vibration analysis based on uh, acceptation in the Z direction. Again, you, you would possibly look at different orientations and different response spectrum in different directions when you're doing this type of analysis. I'm just going to concentrate on the Z direction. So a random vibration then, well, I need to insert uh, a, a PSD spectra. So I've got PSDG acceleration here. 
I need to select my boundary conditions. So we'll select fix support. And again, if I open up my spreadsheet, uh, I've got some values here. So we've got a frequency and the units in this case, because I'm it's a, it's a, a, a gravity acceleration, it's G squared per Hertz. So if I grab that value and we paste here, this is our random vibration spectra. And we have to give it a direction. So as I just said, I'm going to concentrate on the Z direction here. Quite often you would look at different directions and different modes and be interested in the worst case scenario. Uh, solution branch, if I go down, actually under analysis settings, before I insert solution items, I wanted to calculate the velocity, response velocity and response acceleration. And then I'm going to go down and I'm going to insert deformation directional. So in the Z direction, so I'm focused in Z here. And I'm going to insert stress, equivalent stress. And then let's just solve. So again, we're taking from the modal analysis, we're taking those participation factors. So the, the, the contribution of the mass for any particular frequency and then calculating the response based on that in, in each direction. So if we go down, we look at directional deformation. We've got a deformation uh, we can see here and we've got a value. Now, the key thing to note about this value it's a probabilistic value. It's one standard deviation, so 68%. Uh, if we look at stress, we've got a stress value based on that deformation. Again, this is a statistical value. So it's saying 68% of the time, one standard deviation of the time, will th this structure will be below 353 megapascals, which seems quite high. Uh, we can change this to three sigma, so three sigma is 99.7%, and let's just solve that. So now it's saying, if we want this thing to last near 100% near of the time, uh, then the stress has not to exceed, or the stress will stay below 1,059, 99.72% of the time. Now that's quite high. Now we can use these figures for fatigue analysis. So if I go in and insert fatigue tool, in here, for random vibration fatigue, we have different theories, uh, narrow band, Pershing or Steinberg. I'm just going to select the Steinberg. The theory is in the document, ANSYS documentation. Uh, and exposure duration, if we imagine the scenario where this is some instrumentation attached to a missile, it only has to last 20 seconds. So I'm going to put uh, exposure duration 20 seconds. And then I'm going to insert in here a life plot and insert a damage plot and then solve for those values. So if we look at life now, we've got a life based on the, the random vibration results, which is saying this structure uh, is only expected to last 3.47 seconds. So in this case, if these material properties were correct in this result, we would be saying that this really... Uh, this structure is not fit for purpose. We need to do some strengthening, some damping, maybe some supporting of this structure. Obviously, in my example, these results are exaggerated because everything's in steel, the mass is too high. Uh, but that's, you know, the demonstration was just to show the process. So that's random vibration. Now, I've got five minutes left. I just wanted to talk a little bit about damping. Uh, before going to damping, let's just do a summary. So, modal analysis. Modal analysis, pre-vibration analysis used to calculate natural frequencies and mode shapes. Quite often, that's all you need to do. You can usually stiffen a structure, make sure it's natural frequencies outside the, the, the excitation frequencies the structure might see in the real world. If you want to calculate the response and possibly include damping, then you need to do an harmonic response analysis. You can have, add uh, damping elements, dashpots and, and spring elements, if you like, to decide where, where damping should go to damp out particular harmonics. Seismic analysis or spectrum analysis, uh, this is where we're taking uh, a signal that contains a lot of harmonics, doing an harmonic analysis, if you like, for each of those frequencies and then combining them in some way. 
most common use we see is seismic analysis, uh, earthquake analysis. And then random vibration is where we really don't know the amplitudes of those harmonics, uh, but we can create a statistical response based on a statistical, uh, the statistical characteristics of, of, of the input. So those are the four types. There is a fifth type, which is full transient dynamics, transient dynamic analysis. That's done in the time domain where you take your static structural simulation for through a full time domain, but this is usually a very lengthy analysis. Just want to talk a little bit before we finish about damping. We've got five minutes left. Uh, damping, if we look at the full systems of equations here, we, we, can, we ANSYS solves the mass matrix, solves the stiffness matrix based on an applied force matrix. What ANSYS doesn't calculate is, is the damping matrix, and that's essentially an input, possibly an unknown input when you're doing the analysis. And in ANSYS, there are two broad types of, uh, of damping that you can apply. There's what we call viscous damping, and then there is hysteretic damping, hysteretic damping, which is uh, usually internal friction. If we look at that equation in more detail, this is the uh, what, what makes up the all of the, the damping matrix, and it's a combination of this these different types of damping. So if we look at viscous damping, uh, and, and this is where you, if you wanted to design out uh, resonance in a harmonic analysis, you might attach spring or dash pots to the structure, uh, which represents damping that you may apply to the real structure in real life to get the desired result. Uh, viscous damping, springs and dash pots, uh, a type of damping, and they're represented by this uh, light blue box in the equation. Uh, this is a type of viscous damping where the damping force is proportional to the velocity. And then we have Rayleigh damping. Rayleigh damping is where the viscous damping is proportional uh, to the displacement in the structure. So this is really due to the sort of structure getting stiffer as it, as it vibrates under a particular amplitude. And it's made up of two components, alpha and beta. And these, which are represented in green and red here uh, at the uh, global level, or we've got cyan and it doesn't call it in here at their material level. So alpha and beta damping values can be inserted under analysis settings at a global level or can be inserted uh, at a material level if you've got different materials in the model. When I did the harmonic response demo, I used what we call a damping ratio. And the damping ratio is used to calculate, ANSYS does this for you when you put a damping ratio, it calculates the structural damping coefficient. You can apply either as a, as a global level under analysis settings, the structural damping coefficient, or the material level under engineering data, you can apply this structural damping coefficient at a, at a material level. We'll just go on to the next slide. In most cases, the desired damping values can be calculated. So by knowing your structure, you Typically, uh, you can calculate it from the damping ratio, the constant structural damping ratio, so your alpha and beta values, and the expected response, either from hand calculations or modal analysis, and the critical damping value, the damping at which no oscillations occur. If you have some knowledge of these values, you can calculate accurate damping, uh, uh, damping values, alpha, beta, and, and so on. Uh, the discussion of damping, there's... there's uh, in, in terms of how you do these calculations, it's all detailed in the ANSYS documentation. And we do have a training course that discusses, you know, I've tried to condense into one how you an old training course on linear dynamics. If you want more information, you know, reference the ANSYS documentation. Or we do have at EDR Modesto, we have an ANSYS train, um, an EDR Modesto trading portal. I just log in here. And I type up here dynamics. And we go down to this course here. We have all the ANSYS training courses on here. If I select uh, ANSYS uh, linear, linear and nonlinear dynamics, and we have a full training course here, which covers the topics I've covered briefly today in much more detail. I'll just select one of these, lecture two. So lecture two, we can see is 31 slides just on the topic of damping. If I scroll down, 
Uh, I'll scroll down faster here. Change this window. Uh, the scroll bar was obscured by the control bar for the webinar. If I just go down, we can see that there's a whole discussion around damping, uh, the types of damping, how you calculate the alpha and beta damping from the, the, the information you have. And there are some damping worked examples, calculation examples here. Again, there are chapters for each of the types of analysis, spectrum analysis, response, uh, response spectrum, random vibration, and so on. So what I'd like to do is thank you for attending today's webinar. That's the end. If you've got any questions, we'll probably leave you open for another couple of minutes for you to type your, your, uh, any, any questions you have into the chat window, and I'll try and respond over the next two days. Uh, if you want any further information, just to reiterate, the ANSYS documentation is a good source. Uh, if you have a subscription to the EDR Medeso Training Portal, it's a fantastic resource for learning everything you need to know about linear dynamics. So, again, thank you very much for attending, and have a good day.